gophers. For those of you who haven't heard of the phrase, because truthfully, I wasn't called a gopher until a few years of working as a production assistant. So uh, gopher is, is another word for it. It's actually in the dictionary, um, which I did not know, but I, my favorite definition is um, in the Oxford English Dictionary. Gopher is defined as someone who runs errands, especially on a film set or in an office. So I think that it's cool to know gopher is a real thing. The Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular is one of the first places I heard that at the uh, Disney World, that, that attraction, there's a PA that runs out on stage and says, people call me a gopher because I go for things. So some of you are familiar with the term, but if you weren't, now you know. Um, and there are a few other very famous former PAs. Uh, some of you may know some of these faces. Obviously you have um, Kathleen Ken Kennedy on the left, who's pretty famous and popular for what she's uh, done in part to the Star Wars series. That's, we'll leave whether or not it's a good or bad thing to the uh, you know discussion next time. But um, Christy Wilson Karen's at the top left. She's She's one of my, recent favorite former PA. She works with Edgar Wright. Uh, they have a new film coming out uh, soon, Last Night in Soho, and she's also writing the next Star Wars films. She started out as a writer's PA um, and a set runner. Uh, you, of course, have Paul Thomas Anderson in the middle, famous former PA. Regis Philbin, uh, Philbin and Aubrey Plaza on the right, both of them actually started out as NBC Pages, which is always a program I recommend to people in the film department because not everybody knows about it, but the NBC Page program, it's very similar to starting out as a PA, but you work specifically on NBC productions and it could actually lead to uh, producing capacities in an office. Some of the jobs are writers based. I know ABC News calls their PA, PAs desk assistants. So depending on where you are, whether you're interested in television or film, sometimes the name PA is, is translated to something different. But um, yeah, these are, these are a few of the people who've done it before me. Um, and I, I kind of like to set the warlike stage because I'm sure everybody here has a pretty good handle on what life on set is like. Obviously this photo is pre-pandemic, but it's just to, not, not a tremendous amount has changed. Now there's just more masks and fewer people. Um, being a production assistant is the, the unofficial entry level job for all film, TV, new media. I mean, it, it still is a position where across the country, in many places, it's one of the last non-union positions on many sets. It is the entry point at which you can become a PA and decide which path you'd like to go. Uh, I have friends who went and became assistant producers by working as an office PA or, or assistants to the producers. Um, some friends went and joined, you know, IOTC locals, which is the union that represents uh, the technicians on set, electricians, grips, uh, sound mixers. Um, but I'm sure some of you know the drill that the office moves daily for a production assistant. You're always on set. If you are on set as a set PA, uh, and even if you're an office PA, your job is always changing. Your, your coworkers change constantly. Your bosses are almost shouting. Uh, you're all, your bosses are almost always shouting like drill sergeants, I find. Um, we use walkie talkies to speak in military lingo, you know, copy that, 10-1, wheels up. There's always a feeling of pressure. There's a time crunch to get things done. Um, there's responsibilities that drain, uh, range from unclogging toilets to triggering controlled explosions. That was one of my favorite days. I was a PA on um, the Amazon series, The Tick, and I got to trigger the explosion of a spaceship in the middle of Forest Park. I was, I was given that designated that task by the AD. That was always a lot of fun. So, I mean, every day is just something ridiculous. There's crazy things that happen. I mean, if you look at this photo, you can see that there's, you, know, you got a body laying on the left and somebody shot and you got an armed gunman on the right. This is the norm. Obviously this comes from a set where we had some, uh, some stunt spectaculars going on, but even when there's no stunts involved, the actual military elements is part of your daily grind as a production assistant. Uh, this is a photo from when I was on set as a PA. And if you need any more proof that this job can be stressful and there is a daily grind, I mean, just look at my face. I, I sometimes look at this, I don't know if I was constipated or what, but I, I was really stressed out that day. It was, it was a tricky day. I was sitting off set on an Apple box feeding lines to, there, were, there was our number one of this TV show and they brought in an A-lister to stand across him and they were having this big dramatic scene uh, that they filmed all day long where the two of them were speaking and the, the guest A-lister, he needed his lines fed to him uh, because uh, he, he was a bit older and he had some health problems. So he wore an earwig 
And they charged me with sitting off set and feeding this actor his lines all day long uh, while I listened to the other actor saying his lines. So I would listen to the other actor, wait for my actor's line, then begin feeding my actor his line. And then I would have to not get confused by also hearing the actor I'm feeding the line to reading my line back in delay, if that makes sense. It was, it was, took me about five minutes to get a handle on things. And then the rest of the day was just sitting there in this uncomfortable position. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's definitely, um, it's an interesting job to say the least. And I learned a lot and I wouldn't change my experience as a PA for the world. Um, not easy in the beginning because it is a freelance job. Like many of you know, your, your job as a PA or if you're a director or camera operator, wherever you fall, even producers, you're really only good as good as your last job. Your jobs last as long as the production does, and then you'll be on to the next job. Only if you are a, uh, only if you are a studio executive or or an assistant in a studio position. I have a few friends who work at Warner Brothers in LA, and they have office positions there. If you work for a major studio, then you're not shifting jobs every day. That's a little bit different. Or you work for a casting agency, maybe. But if you're working on set or in a production in, in an office environment, that's where things change. Uh, I think I see a hand raise. Is there is there a question there? Um, when you show that picture of you on set, what was exactly stressful about it? Was the actor like not memorizing the lines you were feeding him, or what was stressful about that? What I don't know if I did a good job of explaining it, but I had let's see, one, two, three. I had four different voices in my head, and it was the balancing them out. The ads, you know, that particular day. This actor was only available for one day, so we had to film all the scenes of the two speaking, which were all dramatic scenes with lots of dialogue in one day. And the ADs were stressing out all day long. We don't want there to be any slowdown. We wanted to keep rolling, keep going, don't stop. Um, so I had to very quickly juggle the voices of the two actors, my own voice, repeating things back. And also I had my earwig for, uh, or my own earpiece for my production walkie in the other ear. So I would be taking off the headset and listening to what the ADs were saying at the same time between takes. It was a lot to manage. And uh, it's, it's one small example of something you might get delegated as a production assistant. You never really know what the ADs are gonna ask of you, which is your, they are your direct superior as a set PA uh, in an office. It would be the production coordinator or, or producers who are your direct superior. So you never know what's gonna come at you. That, that was a stressful day. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll share the screen again here because you know, if you're like me, you're probably asking a very legitimate question at this point. And it's something that I asked even while I was a student at Brooklyn College. Why would anyone wanna do this? I mean, the answer may be obvious to some people because it's, it's, you're working on set and some of us love the magic of working on set. Isn't it great? It's, it's so much fun. We are getting to tell a story. Uh, we are, we are basically playing make-believe all day long. Even as PAs, I believe that there are creative responsibilities for everybody. We're supporting the rest of the creative crew. Um, and we are like independent contractors. It's a freelance position. So the other cool thing is we get, you know, we're flexible. We get to move around, but the, the core answer to this question, I believe, is that it's a stepping stone position, as I said earlier. Nobody, I, I knew a few people. In fact, one of my friends who was a production assistant and he was in his 60s, he was a career long production assistant. Uh, he just passed away recently, um, not due to COVID. It was, it was unrelated, but that didn't help. Uh, but I say that because I, I know very few people who wanted to be a production assistant their entire career. They, they exist, but I would say the vast majority know that this position is a stepping stone. Um, and it's also that great energy that you have being on set. Take it from someone smarter than me. I love Liz Gill's book, Running the Show, which if you happen to be interested in assistant directing, uh, Liz Gill has also gone on to become a producer. She's well known uh, in the UK, I believe, in Ireland. Um, she worked on a lot of shows as, a, as an assistant director. Uh, this book was recommended to me by a few professors, you know, at Brooklyn College, but it's great if you're looking to be an assistant director or producer. And she says it best. I mean, it, you could just read the quote there, but inside every person on a film set, including the caterers and even the surliest electrician on the truck, somewhere exists the romantic child who was first dazzled by the silver screen. I think that kind of says it all because everybody has, everybody has a moment that made them want to work in film and TV. I haven't met anybody who had nothing that 
inspired. Nobody I know just threw a dart on a board and said, oh yeah, I'll work as a sound mixer on TV. That sounds fun. Everybody has something that inspired them. I don't know if anyone here would like to share their moment, uh, but especially during nowadays where we're distant from one another and we're also focused on getting through uh, getting through the semester and, and just getting, getting back to normalcy, whatever that means, we kind of forget to reflect on some of the positive moments that brought us here. For me, it was Jurassic Park. When I was five years old, I remember seeing Jurassic Park for the first time with my parents. We all have, I'm sure, a movie or a TV show, or maybe it was a news piece, uh, something that inspired us. I remember watching Jurassic Park and thinking, that's cool. I want to do something like that, where we're telling stories. And I felt like I was on the island. I felt like I was on Isla Sorna with all the, all the, all the people. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Is there anyone else willing to share brave enough to share a moment that inspired them in cinema or television, or like I said, depending on where you are, could be a political cartoonist. I don't know if anyone is willing, but I, I'm curious to hear the moments that brought you here. I remember um, when I was nine or 10 watching Scott Pilgrim versus the world, it was like opening day. You know, I didn't even really know anything about the background of the movie, but it went in, there were a whole bunch of, you know, it was packed theater and just the way certain scenes were edited and put together, you know, the whole spectacle of it, I, I just like, ugh. I was just like locked into it from there. Was my yeah, Scott Pilgrim was a great one. Edgar Wright's one of my favorite directors right there. He does a great job at that, that film. Oh, there you go. I see the poster. Very nice. <laughs> Respect. Thank you for sharing. Those are the kind of moments that I think we too often forget. And I also say this because having worked on set, there are people who they, they think very much, they, they, they beat down the youngsters who try to bring a little energy. You know, I'm not encouraging you to walk in first day of set and be like, I love Spielberg, but let's go here. We, you know, you, there's certainly a level of focus. Let's get the job done. Don't sound like you're a fan, sound like you're a professional worker in the environment, but not everybody likes sharing those moments, those things that inspired them and made them feel, uh, you know, young and imaginative. I think people put that down. So did anyone else want to share? Did I see someone or was that might have just been my screen? Well, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll move Oh, come on. on. I'm sure there's someone. Manuel. Um, I remember being sick from school one time. I don't know. It was probably late middle school or early high school. And I've seen movies all my life. So I like movies, you know, Titanic and all those um stuff. But I remember specifically being sick. I had time on a cable at the time. So I remember the, the video on demand and never yeah. knew anything about Casablanca. I watched that. And in the same, the next day, I started watching the Star Wars series. So kind of the element of the big, you know, the imaginative. And then also like the, the like, I don't know, the critically acclaimed type of like, oh, they did their thing on this one. So just the two balancing, they both captivated me in the same week. And I looked at movies differently ever since that one week. I respect that a lot. That that's a very good point, actually. That 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 the idea of, I think I know what you mean. There's blockbuster films, and then the critically acclaimed ones are some of them are still blockbusters, like Titanic and Casablanca. Those are good examples. Everybody knows those, but there's those those gems filled with you know mise en scène and and everything we probably discussed in film classes that really make you think about what a movie uh, is capable of doing. And uh, I like. There's a lot of indie gems that I've discovered recently. I don't know if anyone here has ever seen Living in Oblivion. Um, starring Steve Buscemi. It's, it's a great 90s indie movie, I think, that is all about making a movie. Um, and it's, it's about filmmakers such as yourself. But there's a producer in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the movie about making a movie. Um, great movie, I would recommend it. And it's just one of those hidden gems that no, it's, I would say it was critically acclaimed, but I'd never heard of it until recently. It's, it's a rare, weird film. I think you can watch it for free online. But uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Stephen. I think it was, I think it was you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, can you just say the name of that movie one more time that you just said? Living in Oblivion is the Living name of it. I'll put it. I'll put it in the chat because I. I, think I, I actually, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, oh, you did it. Great. <laughs> Highly recommend it as well. You've seen it too, Becky. Oh yeah, many times. It's great. I love that movie. It blew me away. I, 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 I'll bring it up a little bit later on again, if, if I make it to that slide, but I, I just had no idea. Steve, he also did other ones. He did, there, there's another one. If you're really, if you really get into the, the whole of nineties indie cinema, how about in the soup, Becky, have you seen that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have. Yes. 
that's another great one that I think recently became available on um, uh, Mubi, M-U-B-I. The uh, it's, a, it's like a, a, a cinema verite, a very very uh, interesting streaming service. But anyway, that's another film about Steve Buscemi playing a character who makes movies. I don't know what it was with Steve Buscemi. I missed that about him in the '90s. <laughs> he was playing all these young filmmakers. So those are great movies if you want to be a a filmmaker. Fun to watch. Well, I'll. I'll jump back to the slide and say there are a few other benefits. If you didn't know, uh, obviously you get free food. And yes, this does still apply during the pandemic. Um, you know, now everything is individually wrapped and there's uh, restrictions as to how people can eat. The, the catering department doesn't exactly set up buffet trays like uh, was the case when I was a PA. Um, but you get tons of free food and craft services is what handles the snacks. Again, all, all individually wrapped. And I do believe there'll be a time where we return to the world of communal eating on set. It's, you know, it's slow and steady, but we'll get there. Uh, gambling is another big thing that I didn't know about. I don't know why it is. And I don't know if this is just the East Coast or maybe it's the West Coast as well. But film sets and TV shows, they play something called cards where you buy the PAs, buy two decks of cards on Fridays, and then they'll sell uh, 52 cards in one, one deck, uh, and then draw the cards from the other deck. I think they sell the cards for $20 a pop. And then there's first, second, and third prize, little things like this. I had no idea. Every set I've ever been on is, it was either the cards on Broadway. They do dollar Fridays, little things to boost morale. You get free shirts, uh, you know, free, free hats, uh, everything that the producers can do on big budget productions that can afford it to boost morale. And then you're close to gear as well. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're into t the technical side of filmmaking, the latest and greatest is, is just laying around everywhere for you to ask about. If it's a union set, uh, you're not always allowed to touch the gear as a, as a non-union employee. There are rules about that um, that have to do with uh, accountability uh, and safety. But for the most part, you can talk to anyone about anything. And I think the biggest benefit of working as a PA is cool stuff. I know how to get to Sesame Street, having worked as a PA. My whole childhood, I was listening to, can you tell me how to get, how to, get to Sesame Street? Well, now I know. It's on stage J at Kaufman Astoria Studios. Uh, not everybody can go look at that, but I, I feel like I was there and I took a picture to prove it. So I'm mostly kidding, but it's the, it's the intangible experiences that I, I find are the most, uh, the best part of being a PA. This is where it's less about the technical and less about I would say it's more about what you take away from the experience and the relationships and the conversations that you have with people. It's not so much about the paycheck of being a PA and working this many days to rank up to this position. It's more about who you meet along the way. That's a picture of me on the right, um, taken by a fellow PA of mine, Nemi. Uh, at the time, uh, that's Leon Rippey, who is a wonderful character actor. He played uh, the mayor in Eight-Legged Freaks, another one of my favorite little indie gems from uh, from the early 2000s and uh, I remember I, I, um, I met him on set one day I'll stop to share because I think this is kind of a cool story when I met him on set I didn't recognize him at first and I went to chat with him and and it, it slowly came to me where I saw him before it was as the mayor in A-Legged Freaks and I didn't say it to him immediately you know we had a job to do I was the first team PA on that job so first team PA meant that I would work with the uh, the, the cast with spoken lines um, that's what they call the first team. The second team would be their stand-ins, the people who are standing in for the actors. Uh, when the actors step off set, the stand-ins would come on, and that's what people light around. The, the rest of the crew sets up camera around. But anyway, Leon was first team. I had I checked him in through hair and makeup, and I got him through wardrobe. And after all that was done, and we were on set, and we were filming, and we had a moment, I said to him, I remember seeing you as the mayor of you. You are one of my favorite characters in this movie. And I've seen you in other things too. I think he was in Under the Dome, that short-lived uh, Stephen King miniseries in the 2010s, early 2010s. But anyway, I said that to him and I was worried how he was going to take it. I don't say this to every actor. I wouldn't have said it to, you know, I guess pick any of the Avengers. I'm sure if you go up to them and say, wow, I loved you, they probably get that all the time. But I had a feeling that maybe Leon not everybody goes to talk to him about the mayor from Eight-Legged Freaks. And sure enough, he couldn't stop laughing. He was like, nobody ever asked me about that movie. I can't even believe you know about that movie. So we hit it off and he starts chatting with me. And uh, he told me the story about somebody who worked as a production assistant in LA. He was on a set 
there was a great production assistant, he said, who always was on time and always did his job. And he was a very good person. Uh, and then one day, uh, the way it was told to me, uh, this PA uh, didn't show up to work. Uh, he just it wasn't coming in. And the ADs were looking for him. They were calling him. Nobody can get in touch with him. Then all of a sudden, like an hour and a half after his call, uh, you know, he's very late. All of a sudden, he shows up on set and he admits to the ADs. Leon happened to be with an earshot. So Leon said he heard he's admitting to the ADs, you know, I'm so sorry. I overslept. I, my alarm didn't go off. I, I overslept. I, I'm, you know, I'm here to make it happen. And apparently the ADs on that job, uh, assistant directors were not very kind to him. They took him off to the side to try to uh, speak to him in a private space, but they yelled at him so loudly and so aggressively that Leon heard it all. And Leon kind of explained it to me that uh, they weren't very nice to him at all. And uh, they kind of shook the morale out of that PA. And the way I heard it was he stopped PAing that day and he, you know, he, he, he left the industry because of that moment, because of how he was treated. Um, that doesn't always happen where you're mistreated, but it's certainly an element of working on sets that I find still exists today. Uh, so I, I kind of like sharing that story because it's another person sharing a PA experience that sometimes you get beaten up a little bit. Um, and I'm not saying that it's right. I, I, I'm not saying that it, it, it is the way things should be, but even today, even during the pandemic, when people are stressed out because of budgets and time constraints, people can still act that way. And it's, it's not always easy, but I like to remind anybody who might be considering a PA, that's part of the lifestyle. Sometimes you just meet grumpy people who, who uh, they, don't, they don't care about your feelings. They just care about the budget and the time frame, and, and then they move on. It's not the best, but um, tis what it is, I suppose. And it's not on every type of production either. Um, there are different types of productions. Uh, if you, I think I included this piece in the book, but if I, in case I didn't, um, there's a difference between single camera and multi-camera. Some of you probably know the difference already, but single camera, you've got shows like The Office and Stranger Things. Think they're shot like feature films. Um, all feature films, well, I would say not all, but many, most commonly a feature film is a single camera. And that usually means you have one camera, it could be more than one physical camera, but you shoot one side of the action. You have, rather, you shoot your wide shot, your establishing shot, you go in for the singles, you get your close up, you turn around, you get the other side, the other uh, actor speaking their lines, the single, the close up, and then you move on to the next scene. And that's the way the day goes. With multi camera, that's like talk shows. Um, I was the key PA on Kevin Can Wait season two on CBS. Uh, I worked on, I was a key PA on Murphy Brown, another CBS show. Those were two sitcoms that shot here on the East Coast, which is, is rather uncommon the way it was described to me. Uh, most of the sitcoms are shot out West, but uh, multi-cameras are shot. That picture there kind of depicts it a little bit. They've got cameras on pedestals, just like a news program um, and uh, boom microphones on those giant boom pedestals. Um, they call them Fisher booms. And there's only a handful of them in the world the way that I heard it. So uh, they, they, uh, you kind of set up the whole scene and the sitcoms will shoot with four or five cameras, all the different shots at once. You'll have a wide shot and all the close-ups happening simultaneously. So you could cover the same amount of material that you would in a day of filmmaking, sometimes in an hour of sitcom time. Um, so there are two different types of production, but they could both be union obviously that both of those jobs were dga and you know you could work as an assistant director in single cam or multi-cam then you have commercial which uh think of the super bowl commercials if you were going to think on a union uh level a lot of those super bowl commercials are in fact union productions obviously you have small scale ones that are more local non-union so there's a range there um and then new media is the the big genre that a lot of people uh I would say don't know about, but some people get into this trap of thinking that you have to work on a feature film set or you have to work on a TV show to work in film or TV. Nowadays, new media used to be Netflix and Hulu before they were the giants that they are today and you know Amazon Prime and all the other streaming services. Um, but you can really find an in for yourself in any of these places. Um, and and there's, there's not just one way to go. As far as paths are concerned, uh, this little map on the right hand side kind of indicates how your career might go if you work in film and TV. If you want to be a producer, it's not always as simple as you go out and produce your own movies. Maybe you have something that you want to, you want to build up confidence like I did, and you decide to start working out uh, as an, an officer set PA and then follow a path that brings you to the position that you'd like. Say you want to be a first AD. I didn't feel 100% comfortable working on 
in these sets as a first AD at first. So I started as a PA and decided I would work my way up. Um, but there's an infinite amount of paths that you can do and you could really enter in at any point that you feel comfortable at. Um, Eric, does it, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Like, I know that sometimes with um, higher paths, like you start off as a PA and you have ambitions to go to a higher path, um, they require a certain number of hours on set. Does it matter if the set is a union set or if the set is a non-union set? Or as long as you're on set, does it matter for like, I know you were talking about the 600 days, become an AD. I know if you want to get into IATSE, there's also like a level of time you have to be on set for. Does it matter if it's a union set or a non-union set? Do they make that distinction? Uh, I will answer that question by saying, as frustrating as the answer might be, it depends. Really, it just depends. Uh, I learned mm -hmm. this the hard way because I went, what I said earlier, my 600 days as a PA, to answer that question, I'll quickly say, I worked just about 600 days on sets ranging from feature films. I was on you know, Paterno, HBO. I did a few days on Wonderstruck. And then I worked on TV shows, everything from The Blacklist to I mentioned Kevin Wade and Murphy Brown and all, all sorts of all sorts of shows. Some were single cam, some were multi-cam. I collected all of these documents in a book, which is very different from the nonfiction book I wrote, but my book is actually upstairs. It's a giant binder with all the call sheets, all the pay stubs, all the crew lists. Some of you might be familiar with the term, but you assemble this book uh, and then that is your proof that you worked on the shows and the days that you did. And you submit that in the case of the DGA, if you want to become a first day or assistant director, you submit that to the guild and they will review it. If you go this path, this is one of many paths you could go, but you submit it and they review it. Why well, I'm submitting my book and then they tell me, oh, there's an issue here. You worked as a PA for about 300 days on sitcoms. Uh, well, those don't count. And I, I said, what do you mean they don't count it? I, I was working under union AD. They were all DGA, union producers, union ADs, uh, unit production managers uh, who, who, you know, not to toot my own horn, but they, they said great things about me. They all vouched for me and my, and my skill as a, as a junior AD. I worked very closely with the ADs. I was delegated tasks that normally an AD would do. Sometimes I would call uh, central casting and I would help book background actors. I mean, these are things that not all PAs would do. Long story short, what I learned from the DGA, I'm paraphrasing here, but they consider shows that uh, multi-camera is part of one contract of the DGA. It's called the FLITA agreement, the Film Live Tape Television Agreement, uh, and multi-camera shows, news programs, they're all under that one type of contract, whereas feature films and TV shows like Game of Thrones are under the DGA basic agreement. And to make a very long, complex, legalese-filled story short, uh, the DGA would only consider PA days that I'd worked on basic agreement films uh, to join as an assistant director and not FLITA films. You won't find this piece of intel on any of the DGA websites. I searched high and low. You won't find this in any of the agreements. Nowhere does it say this. You had, I had to learn it by actually putting my days together and submitting them. And then they say, oh, yes, about 300 of your days don't count. And I would say, well, can I, can, I mean, can I petition? Can I get a letter from the ADs? And, it wasn't allowed. And they said, no, you just have to redo the days again. But I'm sure it was great experience though, right? And it, as, as nice as that was to hear and respectful as it was, I was at a point in my career where I felt ready to take next steps. And I understood, you know, there's certain rules that unions have. So I said, okay, that's not going to be my path right now. What else can I do? And then I, I figured out my way from there. So to answer your question, Eric, getting back to it, I would encourage anyone here, if joining a union such as IATSE or the DGA or even the Producers Guild, um, is something that you're interested in. Uh, there's no harm in reaching out to the general inquiry line on many of these unions or guilds right from the beginning or before you start taking large jobs that are going to take up you know, many months to many years. You could say, before I take this job, I wanna know when I collect the documents, will it count? Will I be able to submit this to you for, submit, uh, you know, for um, consideration to join the guild? And that might be a, a consideration for you if, if it's a job that your preferred guild or union says, oh no, that's not gonna count. You may not wanna take the job. Um, so I do recommend that everybody do your own due diligence and actually contacting people. And if anything, it'll look good on you from the beginning because I, I would hope that the people would say, okay, this is good. We have a, a prospective member who's reaching out. They're making sure they're working on the right productions. Um, if that's something you're interested in, I think you should contact uh, the one that you're interested in and go from there. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. 
And I, I think that's so well said, Danny. And I just want to sort of, I think sometimes people can get um, drawn into the path of uh, going the production assistant route and thinking, okay, I'm going to join the DGA. I'm going to become a UPM or a first AD. And that, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to be strategic, uh, to, to understand what that work is, to understand how competitive it, competitive it is to get those positions um because sometimes if you're doing you know if you're doing first ad work in a non-union capacity uh maybe while you're paing and then you decide you want to try to join the union it can sometimes be hard to get hired as a you know as a first or second ad in the union right so um not to say one shouldn't try but i think it's really good to be informed if you're going down that path no you you, you said it very well there um becky that's 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 the truth and i learned it I learned it firsthand and yeah, I'm not the first to learn it. And I think that that is important. There is, there is sort of a hierarchy and sort of a path. And certainly many of the positions in many of the unions are uh, within their own world. And there's not exactly much bleed. There are some people that are able to kind of wear different hats. And, you know, a lot of directors are also producers. Um, many of the big ones that you hear about Steven Spielberg, he's always directing or producing something. So he's able to translate between the two, but it's not always the case where if you're if you're younger in your career, you don't have a level of clout or you don't have a studio backing you. Sometimes you kind of do, you do have to start by kind of picking one niche in some cases and going from there. Um, and you also don't have to join the union. Uh, I, I do support the fact that, especially nowadays, many companies, uh, you know, even during the pandemic, I've been searching on LinkedIn just for my own kind of personal seeing what's out there. And there's so many companies that are forming their own in-house production teams to do commercials. Some companies are, uh, I'm not, I'm not very uh, politically inclined, so that uh, we'll, we'll leave the, the politics out of it. But I happen to know, I've seen an announcement that the Daily Wire, which is a political organ a news organization, uh, they typically do like the Ben Shapiro show and things like that. All of a sudden they announced that they're getting into film production and they have a new arm of their business that's about film production, brand new that they just announced, I think two, three months ago. Um, and I just hear these things and I say a lot of companies, maybe one day they will go union or, or what have you, but there are paths that you can go uh, that give you different ends uh, to your career, so to speak. You don't necessarily have to start in one formulaic way. There's so many limitless ways that you can go to, to figure your own career out. Um, if you missed that little slide I shared with the paths, uh, I won't go into each specific title because that would take forever. Um, but the general overview is if you were to start out as a PA, um, let's see, do you happen to see my mouse if I move my cursor around here? Yeah, we did. yeah, we did. Okay, that's great. Yeah, if you started out as an, uh, an additional, typically you would start as an additional PA, either in the office or set, which is a daily hire. That's what they call the daily hires, the additionals. Uh, and those are on particularly busy days. Um, if you were working in the office, uh, traditionally and most typically, you're working closely with the production secretary and the uh, POCs or the office coordinators, um, and you're working close to the producers. That's where the producer's offices usually are. Um, nowadays, there's you know virtual spaces for some productions, but still there are, there are many physical production offices, and this is the way it's laid out. So if you work as an office PA, you are on a path where if you chat with the producers while you're doing office PA duties, you could potentially become a producer's uh, assistant after this job is over as an office PA, uh, or you would be hired as a staff position, which is considered not an additional, but staff is the run of the production. So if a TV show was filming for seven months, for example, you would be the office PA for those seven months. Uh, the same could be said about a set PA. If you went the set path, uh, there are many different set PA positions, which I'll kind of go through next, a, a brief overview. And the excerpt that I shared gives you the, the very detailed breakdown that I, that I learned while I was each of those positions as a set PA. Um, but you would go to second, second assistant director next, then the second AD, then the first AD, and then there's the unit production manager, which they sometimes go and become a production supervisor or a producer or vice versa. So set PA, outside of the set PA positions, really AD is the next step there. Uh, if, you, if you want to consider working on set and production management, uh, you could also go apprentice in a specific department, uh, and then you could join the department's labor union. Like I said, IATSE represents grips and electricians uh, on television shows. You have or unions like NABIT, which represents camera operators uh, for news organizations. So the amount of 
ways you could go about this are limitless. You don't necessarily have to start in any one position uh, to get to the one you want to be. The obvious distinction between office and set, I kind of just highlighted it, but offices, uh, you work in that one environment, that one production office, where you are working most closely with the producers and the coordinators. So it's a little bit easier for you to get next to the people who are running the show, so to speak, the, the ones with, I suppose some might say the real power, the, the, the money people who are sitting in the office figuring out how the assistant directors are going to spend the money on set and, and so on and so forth. So the office puts you in a good position if you're interested in becoming a producer's assistant, um, which you can still do on set, but as a set PA, you're working wherever the front line is. Uh, that's where you are working with the crew, with the actors, you're seeing the gear, you're seeing the equipment, you're listening to the assistant directors do their work. So there are two different paths, two different positions, but I do believe they support one another. I think the best PAs did a little bit of both. Um, and again, that I, I did do both, so I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I do feel like as a PA, when I was on set, I knew what the office PAs needed because I'd done that job first and vice versa. It helps to know what the other team members need. Uh, I think some of the greatest directors and, and, uh, and production management out there would agree with that statement that it's very good to know what everyone else does and maybe even do a little bit of it yourself so you can be better at what you do. Office PAs, oh, and if there's any questions along the way as far as office versus set, I'd be happy to, um, to answer them. But again, very general overview of office PAs. They're responsible for answering phones, organizing paperwork, upkeep of the office, and ordering lunch. Those are the four main office PA jobs. They, do, uh, they go out on runs like uh, set PAs do, runs or the errands that you might get sent out when you, you get sent out to go for something. You go pick up I was once set down on a run to go pick up uh, expensive curtains, at, or rather, excuse me, expensive bed sheets and, and a pillowcase for this actor who I was told it was an emergency situation and they needed it. Um, this actor needed to have this bed sheet and this pillowcase right now because it was going to be, so they were in their trailer, they needed to relax. I said, okay, I run out, I get it. I bring it back to the production office coordinator and they say, we're gonna bring this right to them. Great job, Daniel. And I remember at the end of the season of that TV show, I was cleaning out a, a closet and I found the bed sheet and the pillowcase still in the packaging that I bought just sitting there unused with the receipt. And I'm thinking, what? I remember everybody freaked out, literally everybody from the production supervisor to the coordinator, they all came to me at my desk and said, you, 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 we gotta do this immediately. It sounded like a five alarm fire. And at the end of the job, I just find them sitting in a closet. So <laughs> sometimes those things happen where people create, create stress for no reason. And I don't understand it. I, I'm kind of against that. And why are we, freaking out about something that doesn't need to be freaked out about. Sometimes the pressure comes from other places, so it's not always their fault, but those kinds of things happen all the time. Isn't uh, there um, a story, didn't the whole thing with interns, um, you know, needing to be pe needing to be paid come after a Darren Aronofsky film? I think it maybe was Black Swan where an intern was sent to get like a certain kind of a pillow for Darren Aronofsky. And, um, you know, he, the intern then said like, you know, internships are supposed to be learning opportunities and sued, I think it was 20th Century Fox. Um, and from then on, you know, it became very, it's very, most studios won't hire interns unless they're paid internships because, but if you're a paid PA, then you can make the justification, okay, you're being paid so I can get you to do anything, almost anything. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. I, I, I forgot about that story, but you're right. I, I remember internships even nowadays, I, I feel sometimes on set though, I've seen a few people who are working as apprentices. They call them apprenticeships for some of the, the trade unions. Um, but I, I know what you mean. It, it, I, I guess a lot of people look for those gray areas where they can use them as like a personal assistant. Or I've, I've worked with people who have called me a slave and have said, you, you just go out and you do what we tell you to. And I'm not the only one. I mean, that's very, I think that's very common. I would hope it's less common five years after I did it than it was before. But I mean, you, you do get called things like that from time to time. And I, I try to take it with a smile. And I, I, I guess I would say I, I was never the most litigious type, but I know there are certainly people out there who will make a case against that. And rightfully so. I mean, I try to just let it roll off my shoulder and not waste my time with arguing with people who clearly have no they're clearly not going to change their minds no matter what you do to them, uh, at least the way that I look at it. Um, but again, it's, it's very situational. I mean, we, I, I get into it a little bit later, but if you're talking about physical health and mental well-being, 
Well, that's another discussion. And you do get beat up a lot, um, whether by the tasks that you're assigned or the work that you do. So yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions about that world, but I'd be happy to answer those as well uh, from what I experienced on set or in the office. So feel free to raise your hand if, if, if you have any as I go along. Um, I'm looking back at my notes for the office PA job. Oh yeah, I had, uh, I had always looked busy on the office PA slide. I'll say that is something else that as far as my office PA experience goes, um, it, it's kind of universal to all PAs, but if, if you're working in any, even as an internship or really under anybody who has more senior power than you do, uh, the idea would be to always make it appear that you're very busy, even if you're not. Um, I always like the, uh, the, the story they tell in a great Broadway musical, um, how to succeed in business without really trying. It's kind of a universal lesson, but there's a character there who uh, works in the mail room uh, and, and there's another character who works up in the executive suites and they both kind of go about saying they just act busy enough that nobody knows exactly what it is that anyone else does, but they get by because half the time they're doing nothing. Uh, and, and as long as other people think they're doing work, that's what really matters. It doesn't matter that they're actually doing nothing. <laughs> they just create the impression that they're working. So it's the same on a film set, whether in the office or on set. If you're always walking somewhere uh, and you're not standing there on your phone, you know, that, that creates the impression that you look busy. So that already puts you in a position where people think a little more highly of you because they always see you doing something. People would always tell me, we always see you running around, Daniel. Do you ever sit down? Do you ever stop for lunch? I, I, I went a little too hard on myself in my first few years of PAing. And I, I, as I'll share in a few moments, I kind of, I learned that there should be a limit on how far you push yourself. Um, not everybody remembers that. Some people are wiser than I was from the start and just know to, to keep it slow. And, you know, it's not a race and we're not curing cancer by telling a story here. We're making people hopefully smile. Um, so there's, there's definitely a reason to work in film TV, but anyway. Uh, set PA. I'll, I'll chat a little bit about that in case, in case anyone here is interested in working on set. Um, my first, one of my first times uh, working as a set PA, actually I were, it's funny, I worked as the gaffer on this uh, short film called Two Weeks. Uh, this was one of the first short films I had. This was while I was in college. Uh, during my summers, I would look on Craigslist and Mandy and Facebook groups uh, to try to find extra work. Uh, anything that I could, you know, get on set. And there was one job I called where they said, we need a gaffer for our, for our short film. Can you do that, Daniel? I had no clue what a gaffer was in case everyone here doesn't know. I'll just say it's the, it's the chief electrician on set. I knew it had something to do with the lighting department, you know, setting up the lights and, and finding power for the lights. But they said, can you be a gaffer? And I figured, well, I changed bulbs, uh, you know, in my parents' house. Uh, so I, I knew, I knew lighting. I said, yeah, sure. I could do it. So, uh, you know, they threw me on set. And then as soon as they started asking me to throw the joke, throw the joker on a mambo combo and bounce some light off the, uh, off the high card over there, as soon as they started using the lingo, I realized I was in over my head and it took me a little while to catch on. But, uh, while I was the gaffer, I happened to be wearing, uh, this was on a non-union job. I should clarify. Um, I happened to be wearing a button down shirt and they needed extra actors in this one scene, a background actors to fill the scene. So that's the arrow pointing to me. They said, Daniel, would you just sit in on this one scene over here? And they threw me in the scene as a background actor and the rest of the people behind me are all other cast and crew members. So these are the kind of situations that happen on set. Uh, you're more, I would say time is more precious on set. So when you work as a set PA, you'll be asked to, to do more random things than you would be in the office. It's one of the reasons why I always liked set. I found a more varied experience there than in the office where a lot of times I would just be sitting down doing very much the same thing every day. Paperwork happens at this time. We order lunch at 11 a.m. to be here and serve it by 12 noon. It's very methodical in the office. Uh, set was a bit more um, loose, I guess, so to say. And then set PA positions, as I kind of mentioned earlier, they are very uh, high, there's a hierarchy, a hierarchy that people follow. Uh, you kind of start out as an additional PA, as I mentioned. On set, uh, you could see me on the right there with another uh, friend of mine, uh, Alex Alfonsi, uh, a much better PA than I am. If I didn't say it, I don't think I was the best PA, by the way. I think I did a decent enough job to get by, but there's a lot of PAs who do a much better, or did a much better job than I did. 
Um, but anyway, we were locking up a door there for the set that's behind us in this library. So sometimes additional PAs get asked to do lockups. Um, if you're on a stage, there's bells that, uh, that you would use. And, and I go into all of this in the, in the excerpt that I shared with you all. So if you're really interested in any one of these positions, feel free to refer to those chapters. Um, but you'll, you'll really knowing who's who uh, is one of the big jobs of an additional PA. You kind of fill the gaps between the other PAs such as you know, first team and background, while they're focused on working with the principal actors and the background actors, you can help relay between the two. And one of them might ask you to go get this hair and makeup artist for them. And you as the additional PA should know who that hair and makeup artist is. So you can run over there and say, hey, the first team PA needs you over there. It's all about communication and knowing who's who. Uh, as an additional PA, one of the most easiest ways to impress the ADs or anybody who, rec who sees you and has a conversation with you is to memorize their name. I learned that very early on, people will appreciate and recognize when you memorize their name. Uh, and it's not always easy, but if you can get that skill uh, going for yourself, it certainly will pay you back in dividends. People will be nice to you and share stories with you. So that's something I like to share there. Um, can you explain what a lockup is? Oh, sure. I'll slide back for that because that, that picture kind of does a pretty good job of uh, Highlighting what it is, a lockup, if you're unfamiliar with the phrase, is basically uh, you will be assigned, the additional PA would be assigned by either the key PA, who is in charge of the other PAs, or the assistant director to prevent people from coming and going at a certain position. So in this library, for example, the, you know, the cast and the crew are, are back there in the, in the rear of the library. You can kind of see them through the door. I remember they were filming a scene there's stacks off to the right uh, where the characters are walking through and picking up some books. And uh, this was a real library that we'd rented out for the day, but we couldn't shut the building down. So the rest of the building was active and we had to block people from coming in this door. Uh, so that way, while we were filming on the inside, people weren't just entering through the door, having a conversation. It would ruin the take. It, people would be noisy. Um, the swinging of the door might ruin the take and we would have to go again because the sound was bad. So locking up usually means preventing people from coming or going at, at a certain space. You're, you're locking something up and saying, while we're filming, hold on. And if people need to get by, they do it while we're not filming. So that way uh, it doesn't interrupt our, our, our audio or our video recording. Does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's an important, no problem. That's an important one because lockups are definitely one of, if you, if you do start as a set PA, I would say, 95% of my jobs were lockups, fire watching. The other phrase there is fire watching, which that usually means, uh, usually that happens at lunchtime where if you're on a set where catering is nearby, um, today during the pandemic times, there might be you know individually wrapped meals off to the side where in a designated area, but the cast and crew, or rather the crew are gonna leave their equipment on the set and walk away for a half hour lunch and then come back. They would call that a walkway. Um, Fire watching PAs would be the people who uh, a few PAs are left to be near the gear um, to watch it and make sure that nobody comes along and picks it up and steals it. Uh, nothing literally gets set on fire. You know, there's no issues with the gear where the crew has stepped away. This wouldn't happen on a sound stage. You know, if this was in a studio like Warner Brothers, for example, or Kaufman Astoria, obviously on a studio, we've got security. There's nobody who's going to just walk in off the street. So usually you wouldn't assign a fire watcher in a closed space like that. But if you're out in a public library, like we were that day, and we left the cameras alone in the library while we walked away for lunch, some of the PAs would be fire watchers. And then runs or errands going on runs. And yeah, you do get coffee that I, I always get every time I tell people I was a PA, they always say, do you get coffee? That's the most common question. Uh, and you know, it's one of the things you do, sure. But I've met producers assistants. I mean, I, I have seen directors and producers, world Barry Levinson, world renowned people go get drinks for their friends. So this is a job that doesn't leave you. You will always be doing these jobs, no matter how high you get. Even if you start as a producer, I don't think you should say to yourself, I don't think the right way to do it would be to say, oh, I, I don't fire watch. That's a PA's responsibility. I won't get my friend a coffee. That's a PA's responsibility. Everybody does it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mix of common courtesy and a job that never leaves you. So it's important to remember that, I think. Walkie PA, this is a kind of another initial position. Once you've kind of worked as an additional and you get hired as a staff PA, which is that run of the production position where you're hired for every day, 
walkies are the ones who walkie PAs rather are the ones who are in charge of the walkie talkies on set. Um, I think on the West Coast, uh, this is actually a job, or maybe it's the UK, this is a job that's delegated to the sound department. So sometimes the sound mixers will be the ones to check out the walkies and assign them. But most commonly, at least here in the here on the East Coast, walkie PAs, they take the walkies that the production rents out, and this is what the crew uses to communicate with one another. They keep a walkie log, which is, you kind of see just a very quick version here, you know, outdate, in date, who gets what. Um, their name, their department, uh, and then an accessory if they took a surveillance, which is that little earwig that you would use to connect to a walkie-talkie. The walkie-talkie, or rather the walkie PA, keeps track of where the money is going as far as walkies being rented out. We know that Frank Fontaine here, an electrician, has a walkie-talkie, and he's got a Burger King headset, which they would call those headsets that they use at Burger King, where you put it over your ear. Uh, a lot of people on Zoom use them now, and they have the boom mic that comes down. Uh, and and that's that could be two hundred fifty dollars, three hundred dollars. So we know that if that's missing, and if Frank Fontaine hasn't returned to this walkie number, well, we know to go to talk to Frank at the end of the job and say, "Where's your where's your walkie?" And this is some general walkie-talkie lingo that's in the excerpt I shared with you. Uh, but these are good things to know if you don't know much about working on set, uh, or rather the the lingo that might be thrown at you. People say copy that when uh, you, you copy that comes from if somebody says something to you, if an AD asks you to do a job, you saying copy that says, not only have I heard you, it's been received, but I've copied exactly what you said. And if somebody asked me what you said, I could repeat it back to them verbatim. So I know exactly what you need. There's nothing lost in translation when you say copy that. Um, 10 1 using the restroom, 10 2 using the restroom for number two, and 10 200, you're going to be a little bit longer in the restroom. Those are important too. You might laugh, but uh, uh, many, many ADs would say I'm going 10 to 100 and that means, okay, the AD is going to be gone for a little while. So let me make sure I'm doing my job of covering the AD and doing whatever task they delegated me to do. <laughs> paperwork PAs uh, is the next step. And the, the long and short of it here is paperwork PAs. If you're interested in being a producer and you want to start working out or start working as a PA, Paperwork PA is, is a great, or paperwork PA, it's a great position to go to. Um, you will work with the production report, which is an AD responsibility. That's uh, the, the ADs would be the ones who complete that for the day, but the producers and the production managers are the ones who pick up the uh, production report that's been delivered to the production office from the set in a football, which is an accordion binder. You kind of see in a picture of it there. It's not a sports football, but it's an accordion folder. They call it the football because it's always going back and forth from set to the office. But the producers and the production managers will look at a production report and uh, immediately know where the money went for that day. I have a good feeling, uh, Professor McDonald, have, have you ever, have your students worked with the production report here? Or have uh, I don't know if you've had them go through making one for any uh, movies. Um, we haven't done it yet. Sorry, I have a sore throat, Seva. Um, second lozenge of it. I, I we haven't done that yet, but I can bring up some at some point in the future. I'll bring I'll share some um, production reports because I think it's um, important for people to follow the money, understanding basically about in and out times and all of the factors that are kind of um, assembled on the production report. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I figured I figured I would ask in case. People here had seen it before. It's 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 a two two sided document usually, and yeah, the, the simplest way to put it is it's a list of all the cast and all the crew that worked that day, how long they worked, their lunch breaks, if any meal penalties were accrued, if they were a union member that is eligible for meal penalties, uh, what kind of special equipment was on that day. So a good producer would be able, or a good assistant director would be able to look at a, a production report and immediately tell where the money went that day, where the money was spent. And by working as a paperwork PA, you get kind of a jump on understanding how people respond or, or what, they, what they prioritize on a production report, where the producer's eyes go first thing. They'll go to the meal penalties. They'll go to the special equipment. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good way to position yourself to work as a producer by working as a paperwork PA. Background PA is another good position. This one is, uh, like I said earlier, the background PA and the first team PA. They're the ones who work with the actors. Background uh, are obviously the background actors. These are the actors without spoken lines. Um, they used to be called extras, but that term, at least as I've heard from many SAG-AFTRA representatives, the term is now outdated and considered offensive because it means that the background actors are extra. They're not needed. But really, you need the background to tell the story because without them, without those people in the background of a scene, 
the scene loses uh, reality, validity. I mean, imagine your favorite New York City scene and without any background actors, I guess that would be that would be applicable if you were making a movie about the pandemic. There's no one walking around in the background, but outside of that, it just wouldn't look real if there was no one in the background. So uh, Tom Riley, who's another producer or rather another professor, maybe some of you have had. Uh, I, I like the way that he says it in his book, which is another great read if you're interested in being an assistant director. Um, it has to feel real or the film loses credibility. Uh, so he talks about creating a background that looks and feels real. And part of that is the background actors. That uh, background PA is responsible for this, which is called the background breakdown. And again, this could be a whole one hour discussion in itself, but the basic gist of it is it shows you who worked on any given day. That, for example, this is day one of 24 on Gophers, the movie. Um, and uh, you know, this shows you who worked on which day, what their rate was, their call time, when they broke for lunch, when they were dismissed, any adjustments. Uh, there's a list of things that they might get from wardrobe to wet pay, all sorts of different extra money they can, uh, they can get um, based on things that they were asked to do. And then if there were any uh, meal penalties, sometimes called meal penalty vouchers. Uh, again, that's really uh, more for union positions. Uh, I haven't seen any non-union productions that pay people meal penalties. It's a union rule to break someone uh, for lunch a certain number of hours after they reported for work. Uh, otherwise, if they're broken late for lunch, they get paid extra money, which is called a meal penalty. And production has to pay that for not breaking them for lunch on time. One of the little things you learn as a PA uh, and is very much a, war, a part of the world of major motion picture production, first team PAs is kind of the, similar to background PAs. Uh, they work on something, not the first team breakdown, but they call it the exhibit G. And just like before, it's a list of the actors' names, their position, and uh, a more specific breakdown of their times when they reported to set, when they traveled to and from set. And the on a first team's uh, piece of paperwork, the Exhibit G, uh, the actors actually sign off on it. On a bra background breakdown, the background, you might have 100 background actors one day. They're not all going to sign off on that sheet. First team is a little bit different. Those actors uh, have spoken roles, and it's in their contract that they, they sign off on these times. Uh, you know, confirming that that's what they worked on or that's what they worked that given day. I would say that this job involves the most amount of people skills. This is where I had those discussions, like I mentioned earlier with Leon Rippey, uh, by working as a first team PA, I was very interested and still am very interested in, well, I'd, I'd say I would like to uh, direct my first feature film. I've always been interested in making movies in the director's seat as a director and by working with actors who were much more experienced than I was and you know, having conversations with them as a first team PA, I was closer to them and more readily available for uh, to them. And by being available to them, they were available to me. And I could ask them a bunch of questions about directors and actors. Um, so I always enjoyed working as a first team PA. That was my favorite position. It, it involves some people skills. If you're a bit more shy uh, and you don't like talking to people, paperwork PA would probably be a better position since they're usually hold up on uh, on the paperwork side of things. And the key PA is the last position in the hierarchy. Um, that is the one who, again, a lot of different responsibilities, but the primary ones, they book additional PAs, which are the PAs that work on a day-to-day -day basis. They delegate tasks from the assistant directors to other PAs. So an assistant director might tell their key PA, uh, Nick, I need two PAs on a lockup over there. And then th that key PA is gonna be the one who knows which PAs are best suited for the job and he'll assign those PAs or she'll assign those PAs. Um, and then they also update craft services and transportation, also known as Teamsters on what's going on throughout the day. Uh, craft services and transportation are usually offset. Uh, so they're not right next to the scenes as we're moving through them. They don't see where we're going. So the key PA um, as a junior AD, as they're usually called, they'll be the ones to, to chat with the departments who are offset and just keep them apprised or appraised of what's going on throughout the day. Um, I'll pause for a moment to, to ask if there's any questions about those different PA roles. Again, that excerpt that I shared with the class, uh, you're more than welcome to, to go through it and look. And it's got all the breakdowns in there if you're interested. But if you have any general questions about the different PA roles, I'd be happy to answer them. That's just a fantastic um, summary and uh, I'm really grateful to you for doing that. Um, I just, I wanted to kind of relate a couple things to the class that we talked about earlier, like we talked about, we're talking about scheduling 
They're using the movie magic scheduling software to schedule. Um, and we talked about turnaround time for actors, specifically for actors and how they need at least 12 hours of turnaround time. And so that, you know, as the first team PA, you know, you're very much aware of like, when they when they're when they leave set when they have to report to set the next day and sometimes there's some you know finessing that has to happen um and i think you know i mean you summarized it so well and i think oftentimes people will ask me you know my husband's an ad like oh can i can uh can you help me get a job as a pa and the reality is it's much better to know the key pa uh to get you know or a second second ad uh, to get PA work than it is to know, you know. So uh, I think um, getting to know P other PAs is a great way to get work. I don't know what you, if you, you probably have a lot to say about that. Oh yeah, Professor McDonald brings up a great point. We would have, when I worked on, on set as a PA at that point in my career, many random people, uh, uh, bogeys, we would call them on set, bogeys are, you know, not people not associated with the production crew or cast who would just walk up to us on the street and sometimes say to me, uh, if they knew who the key PA was, they would say, is the key PA around? I'd love to ask if he, if he or she needs another P, uh, additional PA. And they, if they didn't need an additional PA, the key PA, they would exchange numbers, sometimes exchange resumes. I saw people walk up to the key PAs on set with resumes and a folder, like it was a job interview. And I, I don't necessarily say that's the way you must approach it. But I will tell you that most of the key PAs who saw that respected that the, the people knew who knew they knew who to go to. They shared the paper resume. Um, sometimes some key PAs will roll their eyes and, and think, you know, that just like Professor McDonald mentioned earlier, there is some competition and there are people who, who care about uh, their jobs and they want to make, make sure that they take care of them, their own positions, as well as also the production. So sometimes that sense of competition between people um, can lead to not hiring additional PAs or they'll, you know, they'll shoo people away who they don't know, who they think are just trying to take their job maybe. But for the most part, getting to know the key PAs uh, and also the second second AD, which is the lowest level uh, AD in terms of the AD hierarchy, um, the second second AD and the key PA are great people to know. You don't want to show up on a set and ask to speak to the director because the director just isn't going to be the one who hires the PAs in most cases. That's just not where you would go. That's a great point. Um, I'll, I'll say that this is where I kind of mentioned earlier, there's uh, certain things to discuss. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Becky, were you gonna say something? No, no, I was just gonna say, you know, I really encourage people to ask questions if you have them, um, but this is really a thorough day. Thank you so much. No, no problem. Oh, and I just noticed now, I didn't see this comment earlier, but somebody says they used to do extra work. That's very cool. Yeah, that's, you can actually, the way I understand it, there's many agencies in uh, Manhattan and New York City where you can work uh, as a non-union uh, background performer. You don't necessarily have to join the union. You do a certain number of, you acquire a certain number of uh, vouchers, uh, and then you can you'd be eligible to join SAG-AFTRA, which is the union that represents um, performers who work in film, television, radio, entertainment, um, and now they represent uh, content creators too on YouTube. I didn't know this is a recent development, but all of a sudden uh, everybody's unionizing. So there you go. There's plenty of ways you can go. <laughs> I got to find hey, out everyone. more about that. Oh. Sorry, oh, is, it, sorry. Is, is my microphone working or no? Everyone yeah, can hear you. Okay, cool. Hey, I'm Tom Chavez. Uh, I'm a former Brooklyn College uh, student. Rebecca was actually my first teacher oh, ever at Brooklyn hi. College. Film 101, yeah. Nice to see you. Your name says Tim. You have yeah, so whenever I sign up for anything online, I use fake names, fake emails, because I always get inundated with so much spam, so I never use my real name on anything. So sorry for the confusion. Um, but yeah, Daniel, thank you so much for all of this really helpful information. I've been working now for 14 years also in the industry and everything that you're saying is super relevant for anyone that wants to get into working as a PA to find work as a PA and get started. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, but you just mentioned something really interesting about, um, having like paper resumes and being able to hand them out to people on set. Um, so I work as a gaffer. Um, I have a company and, and I'm constantly hiring people to help out my company and work on film shoots. And I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me um, looking for work while we're on a shoot. And oftentimes I'm busy. I just don't have the time to give them and really kind of listen to what they want and what they, what they need. Um, but <clears throat> more often than not, people will have like a PDF version of their resume on their phone. And, you know, if I'm in the middle of something um, and someone comes up to me, I just tell them like, email me your resume. And if they do that right away, um, I'm able to really quickly see like, okay, this person specializes in this, they, they have some kind of background 
And just by having a, a, a digital version of your resume with you on your phone and be able to share it at any given time, um, I've hired people the next day because, you know, I quickly glance at their resume that they just sent me. Oh, they're right for the job. So I call them up or I email them and, and I get them work right away. So having a digital version of all of your documents, whether it's a resume, a W-9 form or any like a, even a, a scanned copy of your driver's license, that's oftentimes paperwork that product, productions will ask of you. Having a digital copy on your phone ready to share at any given second is always really useful for productions and for people that can get you work. So I just wanted to chime in there real quick. I'm, I'm so glad you did. I, I, I love hearing from some, obviously you've got the years of experience and the qualifications to prove that that is the way that it, it is very much still working. If you're able to share quickly like that, I have certainly gotten jobs that way in the position of speaking as a production assistant. Sometimes it is quick like that and you just throw somebody a resume. Um, so I'm so glad you chimed in and said that. Feel free to, 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 to share more if you have more experiences like that to share. Sure. Yeah, I'll wait till you're done. I don't want to uh, interrupt the, uh, the flow of, uh, of your presentation though. <clears throat> I'll, I'll jump in. I had a um, Lynn Pinsich, who's a UPM who's worked on a lot of big movies. She shared that if you can find the address of the production office, and she says this as a unit production manager, if you can show up at the production office respectfully, obviously, and, you know, kind of suss out the situation and you have maybe five copies of your resume, um, maybe one for locations, one for art department, one for, uh, you know, production, um, one for office, and you just actually write on, you know, you just say to the office PA, would you mind putting these in the different, you know, mailboxes? Um, sometimes that works. You know, on, on that point, I was actually just looking up very quickly. I used to have the, the link saved, but I, I might not I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it up as quickly as I used to. I know that it exists, though, that, for example, in New York City, there is a production list, a public production listing of where the productions have gotten uh, permits to film in the outdoors. Obviously, there were more filming pre-pandemic, but there's still there's plenty of productions that have returned to production and are filming outdoors now, and they'll get permits through the mayor's office. You can find that list because that's public information, or you can call the mayor's office. I've done this before and ask for a listing of who has the permits, which production company is on that day. Many times there'll be contact information for the production office. Uh, or if you're walking down a street and you see those signs that we all know here in New York City that say this, you know, there's a permit and it says what the production name is. Sometimes it's a code name, so that's not a, that's not always reliable. But there might be information as to where the production office is and who the contact is. That's another great resource where you can. It's it, not everybody wants to cold call, uh, and I, I don't necessarily encourage cold calling nonstop, you know, repeatedly because that's only going to annoy people. But if you were to do it once respectfully and ask if there's some place that you can send the resume, I have been on the receiving end as an office PA where I will get people who either walk into the office or call and will ask. And many times we'll put it with in the office, the production office coordinator's mailbox, and he or she will be the one to kind of look at those resumes and pass them off to the ADs if they're looking for set work. Or uh, I've had I've actually had uh, electricians call from other states who are looking for work in New York. Um, and sometimes I would just link them up to the electrician's phone numbers, the gaffer. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, it's varied, but it's definitely a way to go if you're looking for work uh, when you're starting out. Yeah. One thing that I did when I was just starting out was um, I interned uh, one day a week at a studio. Um, like a, There's a, countless film studios, photo studios in and around Brooklyn and around Manhattan. If you can intern or if you're lucky enough to get a, like a job there, um, tons of productions come in and out of photo studios and video studios shooting there all the time. And if you just, if you're on like working at a studio, just try to talk to the PAs that are there and ask them for a copy of the call sheet. Um, that call sheet is a Bible. It has all of the information for the product, for the production company, the people working on those productions. It's a really easy way for you to just reach out to the production companies that shot in the studio and say, Hey, I was on set today, or I was working on the, at the studio today where your production took place. Um, here's a copy of my resume. I'd love to help out on any kind of job. These are my skills. You know, I, I, I PA, but I also know how to edit. I can help out with locations. Just let them know like what you can do. Um, it's a really, really easy way to connect with production companies that can give you work. Yeah. That's very, very well said, Tom, and it, it, 100 percent true. And I, I'm glad to hear that somebody with your experience is still saying that, because sometimes I feel the PAs or the, the, the entry level is the only time you're thinking about that. But even speaking from a position where now I've been camera operating for, you know, Amazon Live and, and Disney Productions and I'm on, I, I have taken new steps in my career and I have more steady work for 
productions that know who I am. I still very much, I think this job is always meeting new people and telling people what you do, uh, because really you're only, they say you're only as good as your last job. I mean, you're always mm -hmm. going to be searching for more work. Um, and people will probably always call you when they know you that people who want to work with you are going to call you and they'll hope they get first crack. But even if you're a successful director or a gaffer or a sound mixer or whatever it is, uh, you're always kind of selling yourself in some capacity and people will remember you if you, if you stand out in a good way. At least I think so. Sure. I just, um, I put in the chat, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, which is MOM. Um, they don't have too much, as far as I can tell, uh, in terms of the actual filming locations, but on location vacation, it's, um, you know, if you want to try to do some detective work about where people are shooting, I put a link in there. It does have daily filming locations, you know, for so you can, I mean, these look a little outdated, but anyway, um, we don't have to go too far down this path, but there are ways to kind of do some sleuthing work to find out where people are shooting, or it's not even that hard, see the trucks. Mm -hmm. That's true. I know. <laughs> Look for the trucks. There have been articles about that in the papers recently saying, oh, we were so excited to see the trucks back in New York City, slowly but surely. Um, uh, and while we're on the subject of kind of finding first positions, uh, I'll skip ahead in my slides just to share in case people are interested and they haven't heard of ways to get started. I encourage people, if you want to make movies, if you're interested in producing or directing, there's great resources like 48 hour film project, which I actually haven't participated in myself, but I have friends who have, and it's a great way to just, it, they still operate through the pandemic. You know, there's there's restrictions and guidelines in place, but you make movies, you write stories. It's, it's a way to stay creatively active, uh, sometimes in your free time. If you're interning at a rental house, you're working as an additional PA, and you have extra time outside of that. Hit Record and Tongle are two other great websites. These are all ones that encourage you to get creative, basically. Uh, I've made films for, for Tongle, and it, some of them are film projects. Some of them you can actually get paid to do it. Um, Robert Rodriguez, another one of my, my favorite directors, uh, if you haven't read his book, Rebel Without a Crew, um, it, it's very interesting. You know, It explains his process of being an, an indie filmmaker with zero budget. But they had a TV show where they gave film, you could apply and they gave filmmakers seven thousand dollars like he had when he started out to make a movie. Um, I think there were rumors they were going to bring it back for another season. So if it comes up again, you might want to apply to it. Uh, I still occasionally less on Craigslist nowadays, more on Facebook. Uh, Local Zero Heroes is one of my favorite Facebook groups. Some of you might be familiar with it. You can find PA work through it. Um, they, they oftentimes list for non-union positions, anything from electric to camera. Crew Me Up and Production Hub, those are two of the newer, uh, I guess uh, uh, what I'll call them networking agencies that uh, connect crew members together to find work. Um, and I list Dale Carnegie's book at the bottom there because I recently read How to Win Friends and Influence People for the first time. I'd not read it before. I only mention it here because I think it's so important to understand basic interpersonal skills like, like everyone's been saying here, uh, having the confidence to talk to someone, to remember, to memorize their name, to share your skills, to be able to hold a conversation speaks volumes. Uh, it's important to remember that people work with other people that they want to work with. They don't just necessarily hire random people. Sometimes it, you might get in a situation where they could not know you and you're just right place, right time. And that still does happen. But if you're doing the work and reading books like How to Win Friends and Influence People, great, great interpersonal skill uh, recap, I'll say. Uh, yeah, it's just good, good human interpersonal skills. Um, there are also a few training programs, like I, I mentioned earlier, the NBC page program. Uh, if you are truly looking for a place to start out and you really don't have any connections, it's worth applying to the page program. Uh, the made in NY has their own PA training program. I believe there are certain, uh, uh, economic, uh, qualifiers for that. You have to be of a certain income level. I don't think you could have worked on previous, uh, previously you couldn't have worked on productions for a certain amount of time. Um, but that's another one worth looking into in the DGA AD training program. Uh, fantastic to consider. I applied to the page program and the training program, and I was rejected from both. So don't worry, even if you're rejected, it's just one way to go. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of your career right there. It's good to consider. Um, I'm jumping back up top because the other thing I'll say is I kind of wind down my, my slides and, you know, Professor McDonald, feel free to stop me or, or interject at any moment, but I'll just share, I guess on the, on, the, on the side of things that there is a lifestyle to keep in mind. I certainly speak from experience when I say 
as I started as a PA, I didn't entirely understand the lifestyle of working in film and TV. I had people just like me who came to visit my classes when I was a student, just like you. Uh, and, and I would hear them and I would hear them say, you're only as good as your last job. You're always freelancing. You're always work. But I didn't really understand it until I started doing it. Uh, I encourage people to consider taking a course in basic finance or economics. If your if Brooklyn College offers anything like that, maybe something on the side, maybe a weekend course, because I do my own taxes. I do my own. Um, you have to do 1099s and W-2s and understand the difference between all these different elements. Uh, Tom earlier mentioned um, uh, uh, social security cards or, you know, keeping keeping these cards at the ready to fill out start paperwork and things like that. It's important to know these things. Um, so as, as far as the lifestyle of film and TV goes, there's certain elements to remember. Uh, physically, I, I want to share this again because this is a story I share in my book. Sometimes the job really can physically be a pain in the butt. Uh, you have to take care of yourself because other people aren't going to prioritize your health over, over, over theirs. Um, not even the set medics would encourage that because anybody who's taken a, a CPR or any kind of um, first aid course knows that you you can't be of any help to other people if you're not physically healthy yourself. You have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anyone else. Um, so it's important to stretch. Uh, I had I wasn't taking care of my skin in the beginning and I was working outdoors as a, as a young PA, you know, like everybody else working in the winter and I would see all these other crew members bundled up with the best gear and they'd have the right rain boots. I didn't have any of that when I started and you probably won't either, but you learn through other people what you should get to take care of yourself so you can avoid cracked hands. Uh, I had cracked hands and bleeding hands when I was working outdoors for a while because I would need to use my pen in the outdoors signing the exhibit G. Um, a lot of other cast and crew members will share with you the things that they do and they've learned over the years. But from the beginning, you should know, uh, do take care of yourself. There was a moment where I worked for a non-union production um, and I was working in the locations department uh, and I was tasked with, I actually interned to kind of go back to, to Professor McDonald's earlier point, I interned as the assistant locations manager, which is kind of strange because assistant locations manager is a senior ranking position. You work with the locations manager to, to, se to select the locations. Uh, anyway, I interned and my job was driving the locations manager to and from all these different sets throughout one summer. Uh, and I was hopping in and out of the car. I wasn't taking care of myself. We worked long hours. I was sweating. Uh, by the end of these two weeks of doing this as an intern, I just kind of said, I have to prove myself. I have to do the best I can. So I, I wasn't eating right. I wasn't showering. I wasn't taking care of myself. And at the end of these two weeks, uh, I was taking a shower and there was blood pooling in the drain. And what came to pass was that I actually developed a polynidal cyst uh, on my rear. You know, and the nice way to say it is on my, on my tuchus, I had this, this cyst that had opened up because I was hopping in and out of my car and I wasn't showering. And the doctor said, oh yes, this was common in World War II uh, when they called it cheap cyst. The soldiers would hop in, it, hop in and out of their Jeeps and they didn't have access to showers in some cases. So that's where the term comes from. And they said, yeah, you've got it. Have you been running around a lot this summer? Have you been doing things like this? And I'm not gonna blame the production. I have to take some responsibility for that. Uh, but I developed the cyst. I had to have it surgically removed. You gotta, you gotta watch out for yourself. <laughs> I learned it the hard way. Don't, don't get assist. That's a crazy story, Danny. Thank you for sharing it. It makes me think about, you know, the Amazon workers, the you questions of unionization, and I don't, we don't need to take it into a, you know, that path, but like, I, it is PA positions are not unionized positions. And we can talk about, you know, why that is or isn't, but, um, you do have to protect yourself, you know, and I think it's that's really, really wise because people may take advantage. I mean, hopefully that's changing, like with all the pu negative publicity about Scott Rudin and, you know, other horrible in individuals in this industry. Hopefully it's changing, but, you know, it's pretty entrenched. I, I would agree with that. There's still a lot of elements of the way that the way that Hollywood is, I guess. Hollywood has come to encompass, in my mind, film and TV across the board and how people operate. And I do believe there's a lot of progress being made. I, I don't know if there is enough being made in certain areas. I mean, it, it's tricky because like I said, even the, my PA experience full time was end of 2014, early 2015 through end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And as recent as 2019, I was being treated some of the ways that I'm sharing with you. Uh, so I won't necessarily say that the industry on a whole has, has changed uh, you know, altogether, but 
I'll kind of segue into this last slide here, one of the last slides I have. Um, in the line of taking care of yourself physically, um, oh, am I sharing the wrong screen? Hold on, I think I'm sharing my presen presentation view. There we go. Uh, in the line of taking care of yourself, uh, this picture on the left here, you, you heard me mention earlier that I was kind of pushing myself to the max at some points. Uh, when I was, I'd say a year or two into my PA career, uh, I was, I was, that's when I was pushing myself the hardest and I was working some weeks upwards of 90 hours when you factor in the travel to and from, to and from sets. People will joke about their hours like, it, you know, like it's a trophy, like not to be crude about it, but you know, you've probably heard the term pissing contest before. I feel like a lot of people still operate like that. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's not to be crude, but people will talk this way on set. So people will say, oh, you worked 18 hours one day. That's nothing. I worked 20 hours. And then somebody else would say, oh, I worked. Pfft, that's nothing. I worked two days back to back without sleep, 48 hours. It's always like it, it's a contest to see who could push themselves the hardest. Well, one day I pushed myself. It was, a, I believe it was a 19 hour day. Um, and that picture on the left is my car, my Nissan Altima. When I was driving home, uh, I experienced something that I didn't know what it was at the time, but I later found out it was called micro sleeps. I had been up for 20 hours when you factor in the morning drive. I tried to have some coffee to stay up throughout the day, but I was on the Belt Parkway coming back home to where I live, uh, right near Queens and Long Island. Um, and I was, I remember falling asleep and I remember seeing my drive in little spurts of, uh, little spurts of vision. So I would, I would see it, you know, going along the Belt Parkway, but then there was black and then going along the Belt Parkway a little further. And I was just trying to get home because I was so tired. Uh, and that damage that's on my car was, there was a moment where what woke me up fully was I saw, I heard rumble. I remember very clearly I heard rumbling or I heard the scraping of my car along the guardrail. And then I opened my eyes, I saw dust kicking up and then sparks shooting up because my bumper was going along the metal guardrail on the Bell Parkway. Uh, and I remember swerving back onto the highway and then I was fully awake and then I got home, no problem. Um, and the next morning I shared this with the ADs and the PAs and a lot of them blamed me. They called me stupid. They said, why would you push yourself like that? You should have known. You could have asked me to put you up in a hotel. Why didn't you ask me? And, you know, there's a defensiveness that comes into play there. They wanted to take care of me. I don't deny that, but we didn't, I didn't know at the time you could, you could say, I'm really falling asleep. It was embarrassed in some ways to say, I can't keep up with the rest of the crew. There's, there's an idea that you do want to push yourself. So all of this to say, while you do the work and while you build your career, uh, know that anybody who wants you to push yourself beyond your limits probably isn't somebody who you would want to work for anyway. Uh, it's just, it's just not what you, you keep it in mind in the back of your head is, is the long and short way to say it here. Oh, I think. I just put a shared? link to the film. It's a, I used to show this film in the class. It's a documentary made by Haskell Wexler, who's, who was an incredible cinematographer. But, um, you know, it's 78 minutes. It's, it's, uh, it's worth taking a look at because it's, um, it's, you know, it's a real, real thing. I mean, this, this profiles, um, you know, uh, someone who was working on the set of uh, Pleasantville, or Pleasant, yeah, Pleasantville. Pleasantville right? Yeah, and uh, died on the way home. A camera operator, I think it was, right? Or, uh, AC. AC. Um, yeah. You know, there have been the horrible thing on the train tracks. So I think everything you're saying, Dan, Danny, is really so true. Yeah. And to build off that, too, like in addition to just working really long hours on a lot of different shoots, um, for me, it's like when I got out of film school or out of Brooklyn College, one of the first things that I found work in was working in, in independent films and short films that don't have much budgets or, um, like an overseeing authority of safety and all that stuff. So oftentimes productions may ask you to do things that are unsafe, um, which, you know, they, they need to get the shot. They already scripted it. They planned it. They worked everything out and they may ask you to do things that maybe aren't even legal. So as production assistants and just as people working for a production, you have to be very vocal about if you're doing something that you think is illegal or you think is dangerous that you can hurt yourself or somebody else, you have to have to have to say something. If you don't say something, the person next to you who's thinking the same thing, they won't say anything. And the per another person won't say anything. So you have to kind of take it upon yourself to be vocal about, hey, we should not do this. Do we have permits to do this? Um, is this legal? Do we need police presence if we're going to be having a gun in the scene? Because if you're in a ra random neighborhood and you have a pistol that's a prop, someone else walking may not know that. So things like that, just always be really mindful of what you're doing isn't just part of the movie set. It's you're in real life. You could get hurt. 
you could get shot, you could fall off a building. There's a million ways you could die on a film set or get hurt on a film set. So just be mindful of your safety and the safety of others, people, people on set, and also people that are not associated with the production. Thank you yeah. so much for saying that. I, I, you know, I think maybe we talked about this in this class, I can't remember, but you know, there've been at least two student film shoots where people have died as well, right? So it's not just professional shoots. Emerson College had, had a death, uh, NYU grad program had a death. Those are the ones I know of. Hopefully yeah. uh, these are these are incredibly important points because yeah, I, I certainly learned it firsthand as a PA, but e even beyond once you go beyond a PA, it is important to speak up. I will say on, on the same on the same effect, I know many PAs who have not spoken up because they were afraid of losing their jobs. They were afraid of, you know, retribution, I think revenge from from certain employers. And that's not necessarily something that sticks with you throughout your whole career. I would say you 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 grow out of that as you learn that there is a support circle there. Nowadays, many major studios and even some small independent ones have anonymous safety hotlines that when you start working as an employee, uh, when you get your start packet, which is your kind of the, the when you start on the job, that'll be the, the first set of paperwork that you fill out. In there will be some sort of anonymous way that you can report any problems and you should know uh, as I have learned, that it's a safe way to go about reporting something if you're afraid of having your name attached to it, um, because I, I have I have seen I have seen both sides of the story. I've seen people not report something, and then later it ends up hurting someone. Thankfully, it never resulted in death. But many times, as horrible as it as it is, it does, and and it could have been prevented if somebody spoke up. So it's good to know there's anonymous places you can go in New York City. I think on that same mayor's website office that uh, uh, Professor McDonald shared earlier. Um, you can report things there as well. If you see something, even as a bystander, that looks really strange, and they'll they'll do their due diligence, due diligence investigating. Um, and that documentary that um, that that Professor McDonald shared that I also had on my slide there, "Who Needs Sleep," uh, it's it's a very good. It, it builds on everything that all of us have said here so far. As a producer, everybody from PA to producer should be doing their part, especially nowadays during the pandemic to support one another and look out for one another because we are moving together as a unit, just like a military unit, we support one another. You wouldn't shut your mouth and not say something that could potentially hurt another person because why would you do that? I mean, it, you, should be, you should be looking out for one another. I have a minute and a half, by the way, of that film that I was going to share, but I know we might be running low on time. So I think it's such an important film. If you don't go to watch it at the link, uh, you shared Professor McDonald. I can share the film or we can, you know, we can open up to more questions, whatever you think is best. Are you talking about who needs sleep? Yeah, yeah. I, I, there was a minute and a half that I pulled from the beginning that goes even more into everything that we've said, but we've done such a good job of covering it that maybe you don't feel there's a need and people can just follow the link. Yeah, I think um, we, we've talked about it. I mean, I, just in the interest of time, because we're closing in on our class time. Sure. No, that's no problem. I would say, as far as my slides go, um, I had a few others of this of the same line of thinking, but I think we've we've said enough that starting out, it can be easy to think that I am a PA and I am expendable, uh, and to some effect, that is true. I mean, I don't want to say PAs are a dime a dozen. Uh, because I don't think they are, but there are a lot of PAs out there and many of them, I have met many PAs who only care about getting my job or, you know, your job and not everybody is, is thinking in the communal way that I, that I would like to hope we could all think. So I will be honest about that. I've seen it firsthand. I'm sure everybody here could say it in some way from students to, you know, th there's always going to be those negative personalities. I would never beat myself or anyone else up over feeling defeated to begin with, but know that as you move forward in your career and as you build up friends who support you and you meet the right people who are willing to hire you to only do safe things and only do things the appropriate way, um, that's a path, that's a, that's a great path to go. And it, don't feel like it's not achievable. Um, I see a hand raised there, is that is you, Richard? You have a question? Yeah, um, I know, uh, you know, you talked about the whole, the, the diagram of the paths and all the different ways you could go. And I know you said you were, uh, you know, director um, oriented, um, but is there a specific path that you kind of see in yourself? I know you've also, you're doing camera work now. You know, and we're just hearing a lot about the PA work, but that, you know, you have yourself. No, absolutely. That's a great question. I, I, I'll tell you right now, the reason I started doing more camera work is it, part of part of the fact was I learned about the DGA uh, that I shared with you earlier, how half of my days they said wouldn't count. Toward joining the guild that I thought were going to count, that I was told 
by multiple guild members <laughs> would count. So it was extra frustrating. I went back to the guild members and said to them, do you know they don't count? And all of them said, that's not true. Of course they count. But no, they did not count. So it was a big, it was a big thing. And I, again, my experience, I would hope doesn't get repeated to anyone here because you've heard my experience. And so now moving forward, if, if your goal is to join a guild, you could do your due diligence and make sure it counts before you start. When I realized that I was at the point in my career where I hadn't learned everything, I still don't feel like I've learned everything. I don't think that they will ever come, to be honest, especially as far as PA goes, assistant directing. There's always more to learn. That's part of the fun of it. Otherwise, why keep doing it? Um, but I realized I was ready to take next steps, uh, and the DGA wasn't the path that was open to me at that time. What was open to me was as a studio camera operator uh, at Amazon, one of their, their new nationally broadcast um, live stream shows. Uh, so I started working there as a camera operator, and that actually led to video technician work. Uh, I since have connected with a few people at other TV studios, CBS, and Newsmax, and it kind of opened up a path for me that I hadn't anticipated, but I enjoyed working with cameras just as much as I enjoyed PAing, because now I was kind of revisiting the technical creative side of things. I get to select shots. I get to set up cameras. I'm trusted to go out and make sure that the shoot can happen technically when I get sent to a field shoot. So I like to think and believe that all of this is kind of serving my own goal of returning to one day the Robert Rodriguez side of I have a feature film idea that I've been writing. And when I feel confident and ready to shoot it, uh, I'm going to have the technical skills and the know-how thanks to all this work I'm doing nowadays. That's kind of the path I'm on now. I'm relearning the technical side and building up the confidence to not only have the people skills and know how to cast the actors and block with them on set, but also shoot my own movie and do it in a way that I think is achievable like Rodriguez did and so many others have done. Edgar Wright started out that way too. So there's enough proof out there beyond me that it can be done. Any other questions about anything PA related or industry related? I mean, really not, I guess anything goes at this point. Um, uh, I think I'm not muted. Okay. Um, one thing that I've kind of like been doing over the past like six months, um, work was, was, was a little slow last year just due to the pandemic. So I've been trying to like learn a little bit more about the industry and how it operates and learning who's who, what people are doing. And um, I've stumbled upon a few um podcasts and YouTube videos um, that are may be really helpful, especially if you're just starting out your career. Um, there's this girl, her name is uh, Amber Sherman. She has uh, a YouTube channel and also like a podcast or sorry, it's a YouTube channel and she's on Facebook. She posts on her Facebook page. It's called Beyond Film School. Um, and she just posts tons and tons and tons of really useful tips uh, for people that are just starting out or just working as production assistants. Um, I mean, she has episodes of like, how to dress to set. Like, you know, if it's a cold day, this is the kind of stuff you should have boots, gloves, um, the right kind of jacket, you know, the right kind of shoes, what kind of tools to have, um, whether it's like a Leatherman, like a Swiss army knife kind of deal or stuff like that. Just things that like you may not know just getting out of uh, Brooklyn college. If you want to start working in any kind of professional capacity, she's, she's a key PA. She works on tons of different shoots all over New York. And she just, she makes her website and her Facebook group and her YouTube channel. She gives lots of really useful information for people that are just starting out. So I really recommend um, that. Uh, I, re I recommend you listening to her uh, show and her Facebook page. It's interesting because I just uh, was trying to find some information about collecting, you know, if you do want to go that path. And this was the first link that came up about, you know, do I need to be in the DGA? And if you decide you want to go that route, you know, she yeah. kind of, outlines it in a very thorough way, which you're right, Danny, it's never really been clearly outlined before. So yeah. or maybe you didn't say that, but I feel that way. So sorry. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. No, yeah. Just uh just trying to find like uh like useful uh, industry stuff. I, I don't want this to sound like a like a like a plug or anything like that, but um, like when I got out of film school, like I was in the same boat as a lot of you, I think like, you know, I have all of this knowledge on how to make movies and short films and stuff like that, but I didn't know how to get work. I didn't know anyone else in the industry. I didn't know about all the resources that New York has to offer filmmakers. So throughout the, um, the pandemic, me, during the, uh, the pandemic, one thing that I've wanted to do for a long time is start a podcast. And I, I made one called the NYC video podcast. And what it's about is just like the New York city filmmaking scene. Um, it basically, my goal is to basically interview just different rental houses, different ADs, different production assistants, people that are just getting out of film school and just get a perspective of what it's like to work in New York and how to find work in New York. And if you're working, how do you, you know, go from, from one level to another? 
So stuff like that, just to kind of, for all of us to kind of understand what New York has to offer um, our community. Um, that's the long-term goal. But um, if, if any of you have any ideas or are struggling with certain things, let me know, because I want to try to make episodes that really help out people like us, people that are just starting out, people that want to advance our careers, people that want to make movies and, and, and learn about New York City filmmaking scene. Um, you put the link in the um, chat. Your yeah, I don't know how to make how to uh, get into the chat. I don't use I don't use Zoom too much. I'm usually on set. The whole computer stuff is usually new to me, um, but I'll try to figure that out. But it's just I, yeah. Oh, what it's is just, it? I can put it in there. Yeah, it's just NYC Video Podcast. If you like Google it or look it up on Spotify, it'll be the first thing probably that pops up. But um, but I learned about Daniel actually um, listening to him on a podcast called Just Shoot It. Uh, I think it was like a month ago, and I was like, oh, who is this guy? And he wrote a book about PAs and uh so much useful information so yeah it's uh really cool to like learn about other filmmakers who are doing similar stuff and doing cool stuff through media that already exists whether it's podcasts or youtube channels there's tons of that stuff out there right now and you get to meet and learn from a lot of uh filmmakers that are doing stuff so i'm honored that you listen to that just shoot it podcast that's a great yeah. resource that's another great one to mention i'm so glad you connected through that but that yeah I, I, in in promoting the book i was reaching out to and finding a lot of uh, when I took the book under my own arm and I said, I, I want to push it forward, I found a lot of great podcasts, a lot of great resources. Yours I wasn't familiar with, but I'm so excited to look it up and see more. Amber Sherman, too. Um, yeah. I'll share. I, I just put together a few links that I'm going to post in the chat now. Three of them were the ones I mentioned at the end of my um, discussion there. But uh, Media Makers and uh, Kincaid Productions, those are two other great resources that uh, have a friend, Robin Kincaid, out on the West Coast, who has a, a video series about how to become a successful PA. Mm -hmm. um, and then Media Makers is something here in, uh, they're based in Brooklyn, and they actually have, uh, they're the first, uh, I believe, a nonprofit organization to make ties with IATSE to create a boot camp. Uh, to learn how to be a studio technician. Um, and I believe it's open to, uh, there's a certain age limit, but it's open to, uh, to, to anybody to apply to. So those are more great resources in case you're interested to, you know, keep learning and keep growing and work on maybe your, you, your creative side really wants to go forward and you, you can go out and make your own movies. And that's one way to keep the ball rolling. But if you want to brush up on the technical side, there's lots of great resources and programs to apply to. I do believe they support one another. The best directors, know what all those other people do and assistant directors and vice versa. I, I like to believe that all, what's the saying, the tides, tide rises or we all float together. I forget that saying how that goes, but we all support one another. Yeah, yeah. That's funny because Danny, the other, the second um, link when I was looking about joining the DGA as, as a, collecting your days as a PA was Kincaid Productions. Um, so that kind of profile somebody. Um, and it's also interesting because one of the assignments for the class is for everyone, they either need to, interview a producer themselves or find a podcast um, that interviews a producer and kind of give like a summary and recommend, you know, so this is great to, I'd love to know other podcasts that you recommend. Sure, I'll put together a list for you and yeah. That'd be fantastic. Thanks. Eric, do you have your hand up or was that from before? Yes, I have my hand up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm at work right now, so I'm like going in and out. <laughs> but right now I'm on lunch. So I just had a real quick question, uh, Daniel. Um, is there any tips like you can give us, like when you was talking about handing your resume to like key PAs and things of that sort? Um, one is, well, how do you find the name of the key PA? And two, do you have any tips on what should be in our resume, like things that as a key PA, former key PA, you look for? Absolutely. I would say uh, we kind of touched on it before, but as far as the name of the key PA goes, if you see a set on the, you know, if you're walking down the street and you see an active set, uh, there's no reason you can't talk to somebody uh, if they're by the trucks, usually anywhere near the trucks. Those are people who aren't quite as much in a hurry as the ones who are on set. So odds are you'll find a PA there. Or you could say to somebody, excuse me, you know, I'm, I'm interested in finding out who the key PA is. Are you a PA or can you point me toward a key PA? Uh, and then they all have walkies, so they should be able to point you toward a key PA. I have done it before to people. Uh, and then optimally, you'll be able to meet the key PA. If the key PA can't step off set, you could just ask for the name. And if they have an email address uh, or if the paperwork PA or the PA that you're speaking with, if they can put you in touch with the key PA, because sometimes they're busy, um, I would say don't don't push too hard because I find, like I said earlier, some people uh, tend, they, uh, they're they incl less inclined to help the people who are pushy than they are, who are like, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to chat, you know, anything I could do to make myself available. That's kind of a good way to present yourself. Um, now, as far as the second part of your question, you referred to, um, 
what's on a resume. Uh, I am a firm believer that if you don't have any production experience beforehand, and there are different schools of thought on this, but if you have not worked on a set at all, uh, put the jobs that you have had uh, or internships or creative partnerships at school or study mentorship programs you might do with the professor, anything that you might have had that's related to the film TV world that proves you have great interpersonal skills, communication skills. So working with people, uh, say if you were even a, a fast food employee uh, and you communicated with the regular manager, uh, a lot of people draw comparisons between working in food service and working on set because you're always working with people and having those good interpersonal skills. So you could say, you know, I was constantly working with clients that would come in or customers. I would seat them. I would talk with them. Find the things that are mentioned. I refer back to um, the book that I mentioned, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, those great interpersonal communication skills are something that's universally applicable to any job. Uh, and all you need to do is find one job, uh, even if it's unpaid, as an additional production assistant or a PA, or if you're like I did as an unpaid gaffer when I wasn't sure what I was doing. I'm sure, Tom, you could have taught me a lot when I was there. I wish I knew you then because I would have come to you and <laughs> asked, asked what I should be doing. But even if you find that one job, now all of a sudden you can start replacing things on your resume with mm -hmm. the most recent position where you were on set and it will just go from there. I don't know if anyone has anything yeah. to add to that. Just to build on what you were saying, yeah, like, a, um, like even like if you're applying for a production assistant job, like if you have any background in editing or social media marketing, um, even though that may not necessarily be applicable to the specific role you're applying for, oftentimes production assistants, especially non-union uh, jobs, which, which I work pr uh, mostly on, um, they like to work with the same people over and over and over, and they're usually really small operations. So oftentimes they'll hire a PA for a job that they're shooting, but on the days where they're leading up to a shoot, they may need someone to um, help out with like a, a small edit for another project, or they may need... Um, just random office help and stuff like that. Like they're not just hiring you as a PA sometimes. Sometimes they're, if they like you and they get along with you, they'll have you do a million other things. So if you have any skills that you learned at school, like if you have basic understanding of like how to operate a boom, or if you know how to edit, or if you know how to, uh, if you know how to drive, if you have a driver's license that you should definitely list that on your, on your resume, because not only the production assistance, but anything related to production requires people to drive. Um, so that is really helpful. If you have access to a car, that's really helpful. Um, so yeah, just kind of listing any kind of um, additional skills that you may have um, that could maybe help out a, a small company is really, really useful. And one more quick addition. I, I almost forgot to mention that if you are applying for, I guess this more applies to medium size to large size companies, but if you were applying for a production assistant role, when I started out, I had multiple resumes with multiple headers. So I would copy and paste a lot of that same information that everyone else is mentioning, but I would have one that said Daniel Scarpati production assistant. And another said Daniel Scarpati videography, video production, another that said uh, camera operator. And depending on the job that I was applying to, again, more for non-union work, because when you reach a certain tier of major productions, you have to be a union member to be considered for some of those positions. But I would pass off the resume for the job I was applying for. If it was a production assistant, it would say Daniel Scarpati production assistant and then list out everything. If I was applying for a camera operator position, I would make sure it said that on the top, just so for that specific position, they knew exactly what I was applying for. And it also seemed a bit more professional. I, I like to believe that the employer thought oh, this person has a camera operator resume. They're applying for these things regularly. It, it adds a bit of a, a, a legitimate a legitimacy to your con, or to your resume, I should say. Yeah, and uh, just another thing that just popped up in my head is more often than not, I'm not actually applying for work. People recommend me for jobs and um, it's great when my friends recommend me. So if you do have some free time, um, I always tell people, especially if you're just starting out, try to build a really basic website using either Squarespace or Wix or Google sites and stuff like that and host your resume on there. Because oftentimes, like if I, if I, instead of me applying for a job, my friend who does the same thing that I do, he wants to recommend me for a job. So if you have a website and you have a resume on your website, my friend can just share my website with that producer and that producer can just click on the link, see my resume on my website, learn more about me and then get in contact with me. I didn't even have to contact them. Um, it's just a really easy passive way of being able to find work. As soon as you start freelancing, you're going to realize how much work you have to give away if you're good because you're constantly working and you can't do every job. So you're going to be giving away a lot of work to your friends and to people that you've worked with. Um, so having some kind of web uh, website is just a really easy way to 
to let other people know like what you can do. And it's a really easy way to um, promote yourself. You include your you know, photos, include links to YouTube videos of things that you've worked on. Um, I, th I mentioned this in a, in a previous podcast of mine, but a lot of people send me resumes and I hate, personally, I just hate reading a thousand resumes. I just don't like reading that much. I like seeing photos and videos and media. Um, if you can include links, like I can read a resume you know, like 10 resumes, but if I can see one resume where I can click on a link and see an example of something that you've worked on, to me, that's a lot more rich. It's more of a rich experience. So being able to kind of share any kind of visual media in your, on your website or on your resume is really helpful for someone that may be hiring you. This is really, really Thank helpful. You. We yeah. probably need to wrap it up um, just because our class ends in a couple minutes. Sure. Um, and, uh, but I just, I, I wanted to thank you both. I mean, thank you, Danny, for, you know, joining us and, and the incredibly thorough presentation that was just like amazing. Uh, your slides are great, your enthusiasm, your knowledge. And, um, and I'm so glad you joined us, Tom. This is great. I might like, you know, kind of touch base. Perhaps I could get you to join another class. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I saw Ben Ning, he's a former student. He posted it on Facebook and I was like, oh, cool. That's my old school. I'd love to, to, to help out, so yeah. I'm so pleased. Do you, either of you, would you be comfortable putting your emails in the chat or? Sure. Tom, I know you're not hanging yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I just, I just figured out how to do that. Okay. <laughs> I was writing mine as you were speaking because I wanted to, to also say thank you for having me. I'm, I'm always happy to be here, especially at Brooklyn College because that's my alma mater. I love it too. Just like, just like other people. So it's great that we're giving back. If anybody has any follow-up questions for me, as far as PA goes, or you'd like to ask me anything about the book publishing process, because that was a fun thing.